Happy Wednesday. This is the lecture for Wednesday morning's class. Since I'm out of town, I thought I would record it for you guys. Yes, I came up to um, see my mom and to help her with some some things that she needs to have done. <clears throat> and so I uh, recorded this short lecture on local bond theory and Vesper theory to help you with the last bit of homework, chapter nine, letter C. So that's coming up. It's not due until the very last week of class, but I just wanted to make sure that you guys are still in the uh, rhythm of having a lecture or some sort of content on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So this is Wednesday. Uh, lecture and then I'll do one for Friday and then I'll do a review on the Monday before Thanksgiving. So let's get started. Since I'm working outside, my system is a little different here. You can see got a beautiful background. So it's, it's really nice. Hopefully you can hear me just fine. Okay, so the topics in the last module of our course, in Chapter 9, Module C, we're going to be talking about hybridization, sigma and pi bonds, different molecular orbitals, and so on. So this first lecture is really going to be on bullet point number one. Okay, I'm having a hard time with the advancing of the slides. Okay, here we go. So the way molecules form bonds, we've been talking about with Lewis dot structures, we're saying that, that two electrons come together uh, between the atoms, and that holds the atoms together and forms a bond. Well, we're, we're going to be talking now about the, the oscillating electron cloud around each atom. You know, we, we talked about that being huge, uh, like if that ball in front of Target in Huntsville is the hydrogen nucleus, which is a single proton, the electron would be from Madisonville down to Spring and from uh, all the way over at Navasota, all the way out past Livingston. So this huge electron cloud is constantly oscillating. And if you get two atoms together, those clouds can, can oscillate with each other and spread over the whole molecule. So now each electron has two protons to surround. And so we've got also a bigger box. And just like the level of water falls, if you put it from a small container into a bigger container, the level of water drops down. Same with the energy. If you put this electron cloud in a bigger box, the energy drops down. And you can see that on the screen here. So the more these orbitals interact with each other, the more they overlap, the stronger the bond. And so we can make a bond between two s orbitals. You can see that here, this is the sigma bond. And when two s orbitals overlap, you make a sigma bond. You can have a p orbital and a, and a s orbital interact, and that's still a sigma bond. And then you can have two p orbitals interact. And what we call these, these are end-on interactions. You see that these p orbitals here, those guys are interacting right there in the middle. And so they're, they're interacting, and that's uh, sort of the end of the p orbital coming together and overlapping. Whereas down here, we would call this one a, a pi interaction, where the sides of the p orbitals are coming on. So side-on interaction forms pi bonds, and that's really important today and in the next lecture. And end-on is what we would call sigma bonding. And then all other angles or whatever, we really don't have names for those. So. Now, the p orbitals can interact, as we show here, um, to make sigma bonds with s orbitals. But notice how the p orbitals in a, in a molecule, or an atom, sorry, in an atom, these atomic orbitals, are all at 90 degrees to each other. And so that can kind of form, pose a problem. If the p orbitals are at 90 degrees, do all of our bonds and all of our molecules have to be at 90 degrees? And the answer to that is no. And so we'll show today why that answer is no. So when we did the, um, just in the last lecture, the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, and we looked at the number of electron groups around a central atom, we came up with these distances are these, these angles that, that maximize the distance between these electron groups. But how do we actually get these other angles, the 120 degree angles, the 109.5 degree angles, if our p orbitals are at 90 degrees? And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. That's the, the hybridization idea of these, uh, of these atomic orbitals. And so let's just go through this whole table, and this will be uh, the way we will understand all of these possible cases. 
So if we want a linear arrangement, we could take an s orbital and a p orbital and we could combine those. So we would combine those to form two, uh, so two atomic orbitals come together and form two hybrid orbitals. So now these hybrid orbitals look very similar, but their angles are at 180 degrees from each other. And so this gives a linear arrangement and this allows molecules to form two bonds that are 180 degrees apart from each other. Okay, that one's pretty straightforward. Let's look at the trigonal planar though. This one has, has three electron groups. And, and so we, we might be able to use one p orbital, but then the other one's gonna be at 90 degrees and we need it to be at 120 degrees. And plus we need three, three groups of electrons, each with uh, uh, two electrons in them. And so we need three distinct orbitals that we can put two electrons in each orbital. And so this is what we get. We take a, an s orbital and two p orbitals. That's why this is called sp2. The sum of all of those is three, right? We have one S and two P's. So we have three atomic orbitals that hybridize, they combine. Now don't worry about the math associated with the hybridization. That's what you can study when you get to PCHEM or maybe even graduate school, it's pretty ugly. And we form three equal energy SP2 hybrids that are at 120 degrees. And so that's what we have down here at the bottom, SP2 hybrid orbitals at 120 degrees. And then that's what we would get when we had three groups around a central atom. And that would be a trigonal planar electronic structure. So what if we have four groups? Well, we need four atomic orbitals. So we have an S and we have three Ps. So that gives us our four orbitals. So we would combine the S and the three P orbitals, atomic orbitals, and form uh, four identical SP3 hybrids. And those would be in a tetrahedral geometry that would give us a tetrahedral electronic structure. And then depending upon if you have, you know, lone pairs in one and atoms at the others, you would have the different kinds of things on that row if you had one or two or three or four lone pairs. Okay. But those are sp3 hybrids. And if you have a sp3 hybridization, you have 109.5 degree angles between all of the electron groups. And so this is what you get when you have four electron groups around a central atom. Now, what about the trigonal bipyramid? We need five, okay? So how do you get five when you only have an S and three Ps? Well, you gotta bring in a D orbital. So we got an S orbital, three P orbitals, and a D orbital. So this is SP3D. You bring all five of those orbitals together and hybridize them mathematically, and you get five identical sp3d hybrid orbitals each of them can contain two electrons and they go around that central atom now in this situation you've got some geometric names that are helpful you've got equatorial positions okay and you've got axial positions and so the equatorial positions are 120 degrees apart and then the axial positions are 90 degrees from the equator or 180 degrees from each other and so this is what you have when you have five electron groups around a central atom that gives you an, a, a trigonal bipyramid electronic structure. And then however many atoms you have on there, that gives you the different names for the molecular structure. Like the one shown up here, this F, uh, the CLF3, that's a T-shaped molecular structure, but it's a trigonal bipyramidal electronic structure. This one is a seesaw. If we tip it over on its side, these Fs form the fulcrum and then the ones that are in the axial positions would form the, the, the teeter-totter or seesaw board. Okay. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. Now the octahedral one is next. So we need five, we need six atomic orbitals. So we have one S orbital, we have three P orbitals and two D orbitals. So we'll bring all of those together, bring in six atomic orbitals, mishmash them together, make some hybrids. And so we get these six identical sp3d2 hybrids and that gives us the octahedral electronic structure and remember it's six domains the word is octahedral because there are eight faces on this so if you have a um you know a gaming dice kit there's a there's a dice that you can find that is an octahedron it has eight faces and that's where the word oct you know the oct part comes into that word octahedron 
because it has eight faces, but it's got six points on it. And so when we have six electron groups, they form the points of an octahedron and there's, there can be atoms or lone pairs on each of those groups. And that forms our molecular structure by naming where the atoms are. So that's how we would form this uh, octahedral hybridization. So these have 90 degree angles and 120, 180 degree angles all throughout. Now hybridization is strongest in the smallest atoms because it's harder for those electron groups to get very close to each other. Notice this angle from oxygen, uh, H2O to H2S to H2TE. Notice when it's tellurium, we're, we're just using the p orbitals in tellurium to bond with those hydrogens. They're at 90 degrees. So there's really no hybridization taking place in that enormous tellurium atom. But in oxygen, hybridization is taking place, uh, at least according to this theory. But we spend most of our time learning about carbon, nitrogen, and, and oxygen because most of our molecules and all of organic chemistry is going to be dealing with those atoms the most. So let's practice. So here's some molecules. We can look at those and count up the electron domains around them, and we could find what their hybridization is. So let's look at this carbon here on this molecule, and all four of those carbons are the same. There's three electron groups. And so what kind of hybridization is that? It's an S and a P2. So SP2 hybridization, okay, and that's gonna have 120 degrees around it. Here's another SP2. Okay, what about this nitrogen over here? That's got four electron domains. All right, so that's an S and a P3. So SP3, it's kind of like Spock here, like that, but no, it's SP3, and those are gonna be 109.5 degree angles. So here's the angles, 120 whenever it's SP2. So even though it's drawn incorrectly, you know, a lot of times we draw the structures just to, you know, for convenience sake, uh, but that's really uh, should be 120 degrees between those two bonds because it's an sp2 hybrid carbon and then this nitrogen even though dr drawing it like this where all the bonds seem to be in the plane of the paper it, it's misleading it looks like a 90 degree angle but in in reality it would be very close to 109.5 okay let's look at some others so what is this selenium here okay it's counted up it's got five electron groups. So how do we get five? Well, we have an S, we need all three P's, and then we have a D. So SP3D. So that would be the hybridization of the selenium. Then we have the equatorial positions, and those are 120 degrees apart all the way around. And then the axial positions are 90 degrees from the equator positions. So those are all the angles that you can draw in that molecule. Okay, let's look at this other molecule. It's kind of curious. We have this carbon with four bonds around it. I don't like that the dash and the wedge are far, to, so far apart. I think that that's misleading, and I would count off for that. If you were to draw that for me in PCHEM, I wouldn't count off in this class. And that's going to give you 109.5 degrees between those, those hydrogen bonds. What about the carbon next to the carbonyl? Okay, see there's three electron groups there. So you have your S and your two Ps. So SP2 gives you three. And then that's going to be 120 degrees. It's more accurately drawn in this particular case. And then the oxygen, again, we have four electron domains. And so we have an S and a P3. Okay. And then that's going to give us 109.5 degrees for that angle. So in summary, this is local bond theory. There's two electrons in this theory between each pair of bonded atoms or two electrons as a lone pair around that central atom, and that we hybridize or mix the S, P, and D orbitals to give the directions for the bonding and lone pairs that maximize the distance between those groups. And that's called the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. We wanna maximize the angles to get those electron pairs as far away as possible. And so this is just trying to connect the Vesper theory to the atomic orbitals that we learned earlier when we were doing the uh, electron configurations. You know, we had the 1s orbitals and 2s orbitals and 2p orbitals and so on. So those orbitals are mixed together to make these hybrids that can go in the angle directions that we need them to go so we can come up with an accurate structure. So that's it for Wednesday.
Hope you all have a good time doing Alex. Maybe this will help you answer some of those questions. Uh, go ahead and get ahead of the game and start working on that 9C. And next time on Friday, we'll have a video on molecular orbital theory. Have a great day.